Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's Dealer On webinar, Five Digital Retailing Mistakes to Avoid. My name is Eliana Raggio and I'll be your moderator today. And today's webinar is being presented by Dealer On. For anyone who isn't familiar with DealerOn, we're an award-winning website development company and digital agency, best known for our amazing SEO, the best customer service, and the highest converting website designs in the industry, including the award-winning Chameleon Responsive Website Platform. After NADA last year, we were awarded the Driving Sales Dealer Satisfaction Award for top-rated websites for an unprecedented sixth year in a row. Nope, sorry, take that back, seven years in a row. We also took home the AWA Award for Best Websites for a Third Time, plus FCA and Ford have both recently announced that we're now an approved vendor. Big things are always happening over here at DealerOn. We're still the only company in the industry that offers a money-back lead guarantee program. Do you want to know more? Yeah, you do. You can check us out at DealerOn.com. And by the way, we have an award-winning, I'm sorry, we have a webinar-exclusive special offer just for you. If you're a Honda, Chevy, or Toyota dealer, you can save almost $5,000 a year on the industry's best SEO. Sounds great, right? Just check yes at the end of the webinar in the survey, and we're going to make some magic happen for you. Remember, this is a webinar-only exclusive deal just for you. And we have a great show in store for you today. We have Rudy Toon as our presenter today. Rudy Toon is the COO of Roadster. Toon has been an executive leader in online automotive for more than 15 years. Most recently, Rudy was head of vehicles for eBay Motors, where he led day-to-day -day operations of eBay's vehicle marketplace. Prior to joining eBay Motors, Rudy was COO of CarWoo a VC-funded new car marketplace. And before that, he was vice president and general manager of AOL's automotive properties. Rudy's passion for the auto industry dates back to his childhood growing up near Detroit and further developed during his first job with the Ford Motor Company. He earned his MBA from University of California at Berkeley and has a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from Cornell University. And he can be reached at Rudy at Roadster.com. Now, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please use the question feature located on the corner of your screen to submit them. At the end of the presentation, we'll answer those questions of general interest. If we're unable to get to your question live, we're going to try to respond by email later today. And don't forget, a link to download a copy of this webinar recording will also be emailed to you later today for your reference. Feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. And guess what? Our good friends at Roadster giving away a great prize on today's webinar. One lucky webinar attendee is going to win a $100 Amazon gift card. But you have to be on the live broadcast to score this amazing prize. So stay tuned, and who knows, you might be the one walking away with this awesome prize today. Also, at the conclusion of this webinar, you're going to get a short survey, three questions. Please fill it out. We're always looking for quality feedback from our audience, and we want your opinion to be heard. And hey, do you tweet much? We hope you do. We'd love to see what you have to say about today's presentation, so please tag us in it. You can use hashtag DealerOnWebby. I'm at Eliana Raggio. You can also hit up Rudy Toon at Rudy underscore Toon. We look forward to seeing what you're saying. All right, everyone, let's get started. Let's learn the five digital retailing mistakes to avoid. Rudy Toon, first time dealer on webinar presenter. How are you, sir? I am doing very well. Thanks for having me on today. I love it. Congra and congratulations. This is, uh, I know this is your, your six-year uh, anniversary today, so impressive that you've been doing this every week for, for uh, six years. Thank you so <laughs> much. That's right. That's right. Uh, today, I am celebrating my six-year anniversary with Dealeron, and it has been a great ride. They're very good to me. I love working here. I love my job, and I love working with wonderful presenters like you who bring us great education <laughs> every week. So thank you so much for bringing this topic to us. Cool. Get started? <laughs> now, as I was saying before we started broadcasting, um, never did this topic before. So I'm really interested to hear um, about digital retailing mistakes that apparently a lot of dealerships are making and the ones that, of course, we should try to avoid because they're costing us money. And I know you have a lot of great information to get to an audience. Wait till you see the slide deck. Such a great slide deck. So, Rudy. Let's get to it. Why don't you tell the audience the great things that we're going to be learning about today. Let's get into this. Cool. All right. 
So yeah, uh, today's webinar, we're really going to cover a lot of ground. Um, but my main goal really is to help dealerships develop a plan for how they will retail cars in the future, and really specifically through digital retailing. So and when, when I say the future, I don't mean the distant future. I mean starting now, uh, because if you don't start now, your competition's probably going to be eating, eating your lunch pretty soon. Um, so let's, let's jump into the overall objectives uh, for today. Uh, we'll better understand the, the promise of online commerce, some of which um, is, is actually overblown. I, I hear some crazy numbers out there, and some of which is really happening and, and very real. Um, we'll look at a, a lot of data that supports why you should be paying extra special attention to me today. Um, we'll address the question of how will you know whether or not it's actually working? What does success look like? What does failure look like? Um, I'll lay out, as you mentioned before, the, the five biggest mistakes to avoid when you start rolling out digital retailing. Uh, Roadster's working with hundreds of dealers now, and we've seen a lot of common patterns, and we've learned a lot from those, and, and we want to share them with you. Um, I'll also reinforce this, the notion of omni-channel selling. We're going to talk a lot about that today. And then we'll look at some uh, best practice examples from uh, current Roadster customers. And then after that, we're going to do a giveaway. And then, of course, audience, don't hold back. If you want to know more about digital retailing, believe me, I brought you the big guns. Rudy Toon really knows what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. So ask those questions so we can help you with your di digital retailing strategy at your dealership. Okay, first slide is up. Let's do this. What do you got? Yeah. Yeah, so I always like to start out by recapping the results of a, a slightly dated but still really very relevant 2015 Cox Automotive survey that showed only 17 out of 4,002 people were actually satisfied with their recent car shopping experience. And unfortunately, it's not even 17%. It's 17 total people. Mm. So there's clearly a lot of room for improvement. Um, but until we fix this problem, dealerships are going to be pretty susceptible to disruption. And there's a lot of stuff going on in our industry today, as everyone knows. So I, I strongly believe that a, a good digital retailing plan uh, can make a really big difference in improving this number dramatically from 17 to you know, a much bigger number. Um, so you know, we talked about uh, briefly the, you know, the promise of digital retailing. You'll, you'll hear different uh, uh, vendors uh, say different things. You know, you'll increase your VDP engagement by 10 times, or you'll you're set your sales on fire and increase conversion by 10x, or maybe um, improve your, your PVR or, or F&I by Five hundred dollars per deal, and you know, usually what I say is, hey, if it sounds almost you know too good to be true, it probably is, and you might be listening to a, a snake oil salesman. But there are definitely significant benefits to digital retailing, and it really can impact all those metrics we just talked about. Um, but but you have to be realistic; it's it's a realistic progression. Um, so it's worthwhile, and, and I'm going to prove that to you uh, over the course of the next hour. So let's um, let's do our first question, Eliana. I think that's a great idea. All right, audience, you know how we do this. Your first of two poll questions today is on the screen now. We'd love it if you get involved in our poll questions. It lets us know what's happening not only in your dealership, but dealerships all across the land. So the first question is, are you currently doing digital retailing at your dealership? Please select one of the following answers. Yes, and it's working great for us. Yes, but we admit we're not seeing the results we'd like. Not yet, but you know what? We're thinking about it. We're going to do it soon. You know what? No. We've tried digital retailing in the past. Didn't really work out for us, but you know what? Think it's time to maybe do it again. Or maybe you're one of those people who's not sure you believe the hype when it comes to digital retailing. That's fine, too. We just want to know what's happening at your dealership. So once we get a majority of the votes in, we're going to close this poll and share the results. And yes, we will have another poll question coming at you in a little bit. Now, I'm going to let you know, uh, like I said, got a sneak peek at Rudy's amazing slide deck. He's going to be putting out a lot of information. Don't be shy. Just because he's a first-time dealer on webinar presenter, you know how we like it. Ask the great, hard-hitting questions. Let's put them through the ringer, people. <laughs> and let's see if Rudy can help you with your digital retailing strategy at your dealership. All right, Rudy, we already have a majority of the votes in. Are you ready to see what the audience had to say? Oh, my goodness. Wait till you see. I'm very, very <gasps> eager to see. I have to, I have to be honest. Not what <laughs> I was expecting. Um, okay, audience, thank you so much for your votes. We're going to close this poll. All right. 
Let's share these results. Holy moly. All right. According to today's audience, 19% of today's audience say yes, they're currently doing digital retailing at their dealership and it's working great for them. 25% of today's audience, so a quarter of today's audience, say yes, but they admit they're not seeing the results they'd like with their digital retailing right now. But this was what's surprising me. 47% of today's audience, mm -hmm. so nearly half, not yet, but they're thinking about it. They're about to do it. Oh my mm -hmm. goodness, that's a lot. 3% of today's audience say they've tried it in the past, didn't really work out for them, but you know what? They might do it again. So you put that all together. That's 50% of people who are thinking about doing it again. And then 6% of today's audience, well, they just need to be convinced that digital retailing <laughs> is the right move for them. So Rudy, yeah. it is, I mean, it surprised me that 50% of today's audience are thinking about it. They haven't pulled the trigger yet. Yeah. Is that what you're seeing? Or, or what do you... Yeah, this, this is actually pretty in line. You know, I've probably talked to, I don't know, 500 dealers over the last 18 months. Oh. And this is, this is pretty consistent with what I hear on those calls and during those demos and meetings. Um, you know, obviously, we, we I'm, I'm very happy to see only 6% of people don't believe the hype. Um, you know, we'd love to see that 25% number um, improve. Um, I think a lot of what we're going to talk about later is are you know, some of the reasons why maybe, you know, the results aren't quite there yet. Um, and, you know, one out of five are, are using it, and it's great. It's working great, so that's good to see, too. So, yeah, this is, this is kind of what I would have expected. Well, I'll tell you, for those people who are thinking about getting into digital retailing, you've come to the right place because if you are, of course, you don't want to make any missteps when you launch it. So I'm very excited. Let's go. Let's do this. Rudy, right, do where it. do we go from here? Yep. All right. Let's move this along. Okay. So, you know, um, the, the goal of digital retailing is really to, to leverage technology in a way that improves the customer experience and, and just as important the dealer sales process, making that more efficient. And that's what Roadster is really 100% focused on. Um, and that, it applies to both online and in-store. Because uh, consumers don't shop through only one channel. They're constantly moving back and forth between online, mobile, and in-store. So it's really important that, that your experience is respectful of that and ultimately tailored to that omni-channel behavior. So we're going to look at a lot of research today that um, supports that, um, and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting to that. Um, the, let's, let, let, let's break down a little bit more about the different digital retailing flavors. Um, the definition of digital retailing is all over the place. It's pretty murky. Um, this picture, I hope, helps put things a little bit in perspective. Uh, there's, there's many ways you can take advantage of digital retailing with customers to simplify things, and these are the three major buckets as we see them. Uh, the first one, which is probably the most common way that people think about it, is super lead generation. Um, then there's deal sharing, um, and then more broadly, omni-channel commerce. Super lead generation is the process of capturing, in addition to contact info, uh, payments and product info selected online, and then pushing that info into the CRM. And presumably, right, that extra information should help you close at a higher rate. You know more about what the shopper wants. They're further down the funnel. Deal sharing is sort of the reverse of that. It's this idea that uh, the sales agent can um, push payment and product information digitally to customers so that they can then finalize online or when they come back into the store at a later time. So think of it as push versus pull. And then last but absolutely not least is the full omni-channel commerce uh, experience in which all deals at the dealership are presented and finalized digitally. And that's whether it's online, in store, or on mobile. And you know, in my view, that's sort of the end state that that we all want to get to. Uh, but it takes a little bit of time. All right. So this is a little bit um, of an eye chart. It's a little small, but um, I really like this slide because it puts things in perspective. You know, I mentioned earlier that that we, if, if we as an industry don't fix our customer satisfaction problem, we're going to be very susceptible to disruption. And this data is from a, a Bain white paper that shows how fast industries can move online. And it starts back in the year 2000, and then it projects out to 2030. And you can see that you know, the music, video, and DVDs category pretty much has made the full transition, no surprise, to online. It took a while to get there. Um, for automotive, they're forecasting three potential curves, the, the, the colored curves. Uh, you've got aggressive, uh, middle, and conservative. And in all the cases, the lines are relatively steep. 
and that should make you a little bit nervous. Um, in the aggressive case, you see 60% of transactions occurring online by 2030, whereas in the conservative case, it's 30%. So it's projected to go pretty fast, which makes this topic that much more relevant. Wait, wait. When you say 60% of purchases, you mean people are going to be buying 60% of their cars online? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the aggressive, right? There's, there's you know, different camps on this, but the aggressive view would be that, yeah, upwards of 60% of cars in the next 12 years will be purchased online. That doesn't mean that they are delivered to the customer's house, but it means, you know, most, basically the transactions completed online and the cars either picked up in store or delivered. Like without a test drive or, you know, like people are doing all well, their shopping well, and then they, know, they're like, here, take my money? That's amazing. <laughs> uh, pretty much. I mean, they might, they might come in and do a, a test drive, or maybe at, at that point in time, you know, the whole test drive model will be something a little bit different. Maybe we'll go to a central place and test drive three or four cars, and you go back home and you just buy the car online, right? It, who knows what the world looks like in 12 years, but, you know, I, that would not surprise me. I mean, but then again, as a kid, I could have never imagined that Amazon would have existed, so. Right, exactly. Ugh. Yeah, bend your mind a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Cool. All right. So here's another study, the Cox Automotive's uh, future uh, of digital retail study. They do a nice job of laying out the four truths of connected retail, and, and this further reinforces the shift to online, but also the importance of omnichannel, which I'm going to keep saying. 83% um, of shoppers want to start online and complete at least one of the steps um, um, to the purchase online. If you break that down a little further, 71% of shoppers want information about the deal presented online, 51% want to structure their deal online, and then 43% want to better understand their financing options, which can be pretty complex. Um, and then seven out of 10 people will be more likely to work with your dealership if you offer a transparent online shopping option. That's huge, right? Um, it's a crowded, you know, most, of the, most dealerships are selling against five or six dealerships in their local market. Um, if 7 out of 10 would prefer that, uh, you should probably offer it. Um, and then to tie off the omni-channel point, 51% of people want the same type of digital deal presentation in the store as well, so they want that consistent experience. Um, so, so the interest from consumers is definitely there. We just need to give them what they want and do it in a transparent way. All right, this is probably my last eye chart and, and, and marinate on this one for a, a little while. Um, so what, what you're seeing here is, it's a, I call it a touch point chronology that shows what typically happens throughout uh, a consumer's interactions with the dealer, both online and in-store. And if you move right um, across, the, the red box starts getting larger and larger as more shoppers are buying along the way. So you know, by the fifth touch point you know, with a dealership, many people have already purchased. The rest of the shoppers are perpetually weaving between online and offline. They're going you know, both ways. And, and for example, on average, the fourth touch point, 53% of shoppers have purchased, but 23% are back in the store, while 24% are shopping you online at that point. Um, so, so when you see it like this, you better understand why 51% why of people on the previous slide want the same deal presentation in store as they see online. Since they're weaving back and forth, why should the numbers look any different? Why should the presentation be any different? Um, and, and, and that's what we have to deliver consistency. All right, so you know the data on this slide is, is also from Cox, and it reinforces that omni-channel point. Um, they report that a, there's a 172% increase in customer satisfaction with time spent at the dealership when online shopping was combined with an in-store purchase. So hopefully they've gotten 40% of the work done online, and they come into the dealership, and they're that much happier with how fast it goes and how much more efficient it is. 74% um, of, of buyers who engaged with online F&I were satisfied with their purchase versus only 56% of buyers who engaged in the traditional uh, in-store F&I experience. So, you know, the point here is being educated on all elements of the transaction before coming into the store makes a really big impact on, on how people feel about the overall transaction. All right, so here's just a couple quick screenshots of what Omnichannel might look like. Uh, there's plenty more I could show, but uh, the point here is, you know, the, the key is that it should actually look the same no matter where the shopper is, at, at the store, on their mobile, or at home. And in this picture, you can see a sales agent is logged into the in-store version of digital retailing, 
and they have a few extra features at their disposal that the consumer wouldn't have access to at home, like an agent selector to pick themselves, a customer lookup button, so if that customer came into the store after working online, they could look up ex exactly where they left off and they came into the store. And then an inventory finder, something to you know, you know get a specific car and, and, and then start working on payments. And in this picture, sales agents can quickly show customers all the differences between trim options and then all the inventory available for each one. Just finding the right car can often take a lot of time. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, it could be an hour. And then here, once a deal is actually built for, let's say, a phone up, a sales agent or a, a BDC rep could share details back to the customer via text uh, and or email and then allow them to complete the purchase from home if that's what they want. So that's that, that push versus pull I was talking about before, and this is how it's done. And then on the back end, uh, you know, the sales agent can track the progress of the shopper as they work through the steps of the purchase process. So if they get stuck at any step, the agent can simply just reach out via messaging or phone. People are happy to take a phone call if you're providing high value. And then offer assistance, or you can use automated messages that can be sent out based on certain program triggers. Um, you know, in the, in the omni-channel commerce world, you have so much more visibility into what shoppers are actually doing as compared to the traditional, you know, lead world when, you're, you know, you've got to call them to, to find out what's happening. And, and just one last reminder on this omni-channel thing, right, 172% increase in, in satisfaction. This is just, it really makes a difference. So, you know, results. Um, you know, we've We've been working with hundreds of dealers over the last uh, couple of years now, and the results are strong. So uh, probably the most important number, the dealer net promoter score, which measures the likelihood that a consumer would recommend you know, the store to uh, friends or relatives, that averages consistently in the mid-80s, whereas the industry average is the mid-40s, and that hasn't gotten better in a long time. So you know, this, this approach gets a far higher net promoter score. Um, Customers are also deeply engaging with, with the digital tools, and when they're effectively integrated into the website and, and other uh, marketing channels, we typically see 30% of dealership website visitors also participating in, in Roadster's digital retailing platform. And then agents, they'll report saving three to six hours of, of time savings uh, over the course of a customer deal. You know, that's both online and in-store. So there's a significant time savings, and that translates into cost savings for the dealership. Close rates are strong, you know, north of 15% for the leads that are, are coming in through this channel. Um, and then F&I penetration is stronger than average as well. Dealers are, are usually getting three bytes at the Apple. Two are presented, uh, they get two bytes during the online presentation, and then typically a third time um, at the time of pickup or, or delivery. So the, so the results are strong. All right, so the key to all of this is making the customer journey really as easy and seamless as possible. And I think Steve Jobs put the best. You've got to start with a customer experience and work back towards the technology. So if, you, if your digital retailing tools don't align with how shoppers want to shop, which is really a, you know, a seamless, transparent process, then all the technology in the world doesn't really make much of a difference. So we've got to get that consumer experience right. And I think um, the industry is, is moving fast this way. Uh, we're going to learn a lot over the next couple of years. All right, success needs a champion. One of the things that, that may seem daunting about moving to omnichannel commerce is the amount of process change that is likely required of your store, and, and there is a fair amount. But the number one predictor of success that we've seen across all of our dealerships uh, that we've worked with is, is whether or not there is a strong and respected champion driving the change at the store. And in automotive retail, right, the short-term pressure is always going to be there. It's probably worse than any other industry in that respect. Every 30 days, you got to hit your number. The champion really needs to have the ability, and, and I call it political capital, at the store to invest in the future and then rise above those, those short-term pressures and, and figure this out. So without further ado, we're finally getting to the five mistakes to avoid. I use that phrase a lot. Um, Without further ado. <laughs> yeah, for, being, being, uh, being half pregnant really is, is it's, a, it's a great term. Um, 
you know, it's, it's important to have strong convictions in, in how you see automotive retail changing. So if you only half commit to your vision and don't communicate and implement change with real purpose in the store, you know, your colleagues will sense that wishy-washiness and they're not going to follow your lead. So you, you have to really ask yourself, you know, do you fundamentally believe we are ready to start transacting digitally? I, I personally know that we are because I, I see it happening. But, you know, you have to ask yourself if you're willing to make yourself accountable to, to driving that change. And ultimately being half pregnant is really, it's an uncomfortable place to be and it, it's just not worthwhile. So this is, this is the first one. All right, number two, diving in without a plan. Uh, effective change manage management really um, requires a solid plan as well. You know your organization well. You know how much change you can implement at one time before things start to break. Uh, so you, you have to develop a realistic and pragmatic plan to get from point A to point B. And we really recommend picking a beachhead to initially focus on and get early wins versus trying to boil the ocean at once. Um, and, and so, you know, pick a department and go, go all in with conviction. That could be your internet or your BDC department. Maybe it's your trade valuation process on the, on the used car side. Uh, some stores start with doing the showroom uh, only. They don't do it online, they just do it in the showroom. Or they'll focus on online F&I. Once you establish that beachhead, you know, you can credibly move forward and, and roll out the other areas and ultimately get to the full omni-channel vision, but your team will follow you along uh, due to the initial success. So don't try to boil the ocean. You know, find your first beachhead. All right, number three, no price transparency or consistency. This is the, the third mistake. It's probably the biggest one. Um, it's, it's my biggest pet peeve. Consumers really want to see very clear pricing, and they want it to be consistent across all the channels that they use, whether online or in-store. So pre presenting a consistent and fair price that's easy to understand, it's really the fastest way to gain trust with customers. And it'll speed up your transition to more efficient selling. Um, that all that back and forth is unproductive, takes hours and hours. This is the way to, to cut through that. Uh, you know, I often hear dealers say that they think they're transparent and fair, but in the same breath, they'll say, but we like to take a shot at walk-ins or, or fresh ups, and we start them at MSRP. So they essentially want to take a big swing and see if they can they can hit a home run. And while I understand the reason for this approach, it forever hampers their ability to move you know, toward a faster and higher customer satisfaction uh, sales process. And by, by no means do you have to be a one price store. Most of Roadster's customers are actually not one price stores. But you, do, you really should think about leading with a, a fair market price for all your customers. And I don't do know how many really of you guys are baseball fans. I was going to say, What's do that? you really believe that somebody who's a walk-in hasn't already looked at their website? Um, yes, a lot. That, that, that's common. Um, and it, it does happen. Um, you know, it, they, they keep doing it because it works every now and then. Um, but yeah, that's, that's probably most dealerships still. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I like to use the, uh, the baseball analogy. I don't know if you're a big Phillies fan there, but, um, I am. the slugging Please. percentage. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, the slugging percentage analogy, you know, you can have a really high slugging percentage in baseball by hitting doubles and singles with a really high batting average, mm -hmm. um, or you can get it by hitting home runs, but usually at a lower average with a lot of strikeouts. Right. Um, and, and, you know, we're really trying to push towards that, you know, slugging percentage with doubles and singles, and I think you can hit plenty of doubles. It's not all about singles. Um, and, and auto retail will be in a much better place when we're all selling that way. Um, and the same applies, it's not just the price of the car, right? It's the price of the service protection plans, the accessories. Show all those prices and show them at a fair price, not your bottom of the barrel price, but a fair price. All right, let's get to our, our second poll question. That's right. Our second and final poll question is on the screen now. All right, audience, we want to know what kind of upfront pricing is your dealership comfortable showing online? Please select all of the answers that apply. So we have the price of the car, finance and lease pricing, service and protection plans and accessories, 
Would you give people a trade-in offer price online? Or we have that last answer, are you crazy? We don't share upfront pricing. Psh. Okay, so once we get a majority of the votes in, we're going to close this poll and share the results. And um, um, uh, I didn't know, Rudy, if you wanted to clarify what kind of, when, it, when we say upfront price of the car, do you mean more than one different kind of price or is there a specific price that you're looking for? Uh, some yeah, people, some people I've seen dealerships post five different prices for cars, which I think is ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've seen that too, but it's really this idea of providing a, you know, not, not an MSRP mm -hmm. price, but a, you know, a transactable fair market price. Um, that means different things to different people, so, you know, take that for what it's worth. But, you know, it's, it's something different than, than an MSRP price where you're being realistic about the market conditions. Fair enough. All right. Well, we already have a majority of the votes in. Audience, thank you so much for participating in our poll questions. We really appreciate it. All right. If you're ready, Rudy, I'm going to close this poll, and let's see what the audience had to say. I think he's ready. All right. Here we go. <laughs> All right, what yeah, kind of, I was waiting. I was, I was going to say something <laughs> after I saw the numbers. What kind of upfront pricing is your dealership comfortable showing online? Well, 90%, 90% of today's audience say, hey, we're going to show the price of our car up online, the, you know, the upfront pricing. All right, 90%. 59% of today's audience say they're comfortable showing finance and lease pricing as well. 34% of today's audience say service, protection plans, and accessories. Yep, we do that. 34% said they also post trade-in offers online. Wow, that's impressive. And 10% of today's audience said, are you crazy? We don't share upfront pricing. What? Yeah. <laughs> so if this it were is, you. interesting. Very interesting, right? Yeah. If it were you and it's your dealership. Are you saying transparency is king and you would do all of this stuff? So I think if you really want to get to a, a frictionless transaction, you know, ultimately you have to solve each of these layers um, or pieces of the transaction. Um, and I think a lot of dealerships haven't really had to or hadn't thought that much about, you know, geez, how, how do I want to present service and protection plans online? You know, do I... How do I price those? So these are tougher decisions because I just hadn't had to think about them much yet. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, in order to, to get those customer satisfaction numbers up, uh, you have to address each of these pieces because the customer wants to get this done before they come into the store, and then they want to pick up the car in 30 you know, to 60 minutes. Um, so, but, but this is encouraging. It's nice to see that people are uh, open to providing their lease, uh, you know, um, and, and markups and, and everything else online. That's that's great to see. I'm surprised yeah, that 34 percent with the trade-in offer because I hear a lot of dealerships yeah, saying, "No, no, no, we got to see the car, bring it here to our dealership." You know. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think it's just an industry thing where uh, you don't have much of a choice. So many other people are willing to, to put offers on people's cars, uh, sight unseen, with some photographs or other information, and you know, you put a caveat that the car has to be as described. Otherwise, I'm going to adjust my price when I pick up the car, but that's definitely starting to happen more. All right. All right. Back to you, Rudy. All right. Okay. Let's, uh, let's my, uh, it doesn't like you. Stalling it. <laughs> there, there, there we go. go. Okay. So let's go to number four. We call this the, the false start or the lack of buy-in. Um, and this is similar to diving in without a plan, but it's a little bit more nuanced. We see a lot of examples of dealers that decide to move forward with digital retailing. They'll sign a contract, uh, but they don't really involve their teams in either, A, that decision process in the first place, or the planning process after they, they sign the contract. And even on, on several occasions, our team has traveled and, and shown up for training at a store, and there are really key people there that have no clue why our team is there. They weren't, you know, that those people weren't included in any of those planning or integration processes, and they ultimately feel disenfranchised um, by the whole process and, and that leads them to sabotaging the initiative and making it unsuccessful before it even has a chance to really get started, hence the, the false start concept. Um, so, you know, it's super important to encourage ownership from the team and get them involved early and often. Um, the earlier, the better, um, and buy-in is critical to making this successful. 
it's it's kind of like a um, I liken it to uh, an organ um, implant. You know, it can be rejected if if uh, a few things aren't right in the body, um, and it's the same thing here. All right, the fifth and final big mistake that we see it's we call this lack of a transition plan, and and once again, you really need to think about how different employees at the dealership may start to wonder how their roles are going to change as you move this direction. A lot of them are going to feel afraid, and, and some of them are going to be concerned that they're going to lose their job, that they're going to get replaced by automation. Um, and so that's something you should openly address. Um, and, and we really encourage you to you know, recast the roles. It's important to get in front of those fears, lay out how the roles are going to change, and start uh, implementing the different omni-channel um, commerce modules as you start changing the different roles in the store. Uh, for example, um, oops, went too fast there. Uh, the desk manager will you know, maybe have the opportunity to, to really focus on managing the team and spending time with customers as opposed to cranking out calculations behind the desk since a lot of that will be automated. Or maybe your BDC team can be uh, you know, retrained to take customers beyond appointment setting and into sharing digital deals, all that sharing I was talking about before. So let's re repurpose those folks and create a you know, higher value function um, that they can feel you know, a part of. Um, so that's, you know, those are the best ways to address the, the, the major problems that we see. I could, I could certainly go on, but um, you know, those are the big ones. So the importance uh, uh, of Omnichannel, I'm gonna recap this one more time. Um, over 90% of people will start their purchase process online, but then over 90% of those customers today are going to finish the transaction in store. So even if you offer home delivery, you know, most of the people are still going to come into the store, and customers are going to expect that same efficiency in store as they see online, and so be respectful of their time when they come in. Um, there are so many touch points throughout the buying process. You know, letting the customer pick up where, where they left off um, and each part of those, each one of those steps is key to customer satisfaction. And with, with in-store tools, your sales team can take the customer from start to finish, and they can do it much more quickly. With the right tools, your sales team can establish really a deeper, more trusting relationship with their customers, since they'll be focused on really being a, you know, a product specialist versus a negotiator. Um, and so that, that sort of conflict that's you know, typical in a, in a car transaction just kind of goes away. And you're focusing on the attributes of the car, what makes it special, why they should be looking at tire and wheel protection and the, the extended warranty, et cetera. That's what the conversation should be about. And then last but not least, this is a huge factor, and, and um, I know that David Kane's been on this show a few times, and he talks a lot about this. You know, how do you find the right employees? How do you make this job appealing to the millennial generation, right? They expect to use modern technology as much as your customers do. So modernizing the sales process opens up a whole new labor force. And given how hard it, it is to hire for pretty much every dealership I talk to, this is, this is huge. The, 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 the person who's maybe fresh out of school is going to be much more interested in working in an Apple store-like environment as opposed to the tra traditional um, you know, desk, desk environment. All right, so I've got a couple case studies or, or best practice examples we can go through a couple roads to customers, and um, they do things differently, uh, but they both have a lot of success. So the first one is Anderson Honda, which is you know, a longtime partner of Roadster, and, and really they're an incredible operation in uh, Northern California. They're one of the leading Honda dealers in NorCal. And they do a great job of proactively using Roadster software with all their phone ups and internet leads, regardless of the source. So even leads for TrueCar or Edmonds or you know maybe it's a, a cars.com or Auto Trader lead, they're going to remotely share a dynamic deal page with with those customers. So they'll push the deal to all their leads, and then they'll use a, a concierge-focused approach to walk customers through the online process. So they might still actually have a phone call and talk about the, the car purchase, but they'll encourage that shopper to get as much of the process done online as they're comfortable with, and, and that saves everybody time. And that's, that's a very personalized experience. They'll, you know, through text messaging, um, you know, they'll, they'll do it all. 
And what's also cool is they do it with one sales team that covers the floor and the internet business. So, you know, in this omni-channel world with people coming in and out of the store, doing it with one sales team has been very productive for them. And, and they do it with a small number of people. It's really efficient. So now Roadster really represents about a third of their internet leads and, and ultimately touches two-thirds of all the sales um, at one point or another. And then they see close rates um, about, at about 35% for online orders, which is three times the conversion of internet leads. And all those customers get an expedited uh, process in store with the paperwork being done during the test drive. If that customer is going to come in and do the test drive, they get, they're getting all the paperwork ready, get the customer in and out in 30 to 60 minutes. So it's been great to see, uh, see how they use the tools. So that's, that's one example. Another great one is uh, Toyota and Honda of Seattle, same ownership group, also great partners. Uh, they went to one price about three years ago and really haven't looked back. And they're incredibly tech-oriented. They, they're the dealership that's shooting for that Apple store-like look and feel inside, uh, really almost the same exact uh, look and feel. And then for hiring, they've been able to appeal to millennials, not necessarily from the auto industry. In fact, they often will look outside the industry. And then they do a great job of training them on the technology. That is what they have decided to invest in. And they use Roadster to present the inventory and start the pencil process on iPads. Sales managers are rarely um, involved, certainly there for certain escalations, but they're rarely having to get involved. And then the entire team shares the interactive deal sheets with customers, um, in-store, online, with phone-ups, pretty much everybody. And then they have document specialists that confirm the deals, but the sales team really takes them all the way through the process. So it's you know a one-person, one-price model. And they've been able to use Roadster to ex expedite the sales process, which you know, in turn, allows each salesperson to handle more customers, so they're also a very lean operation. And they've noticed that customers actually will spend, on average, um, you know, upwards of $500 more because of the ease of the transaction. And I know you guys all deal with grinders, and it's painful, uh, but this model really does attract the person who values their time, and they're willing to spend more money, so the conversation's more about convenience and, and much less about price. And I'm happy to talk to anybody more about other case studies, but I just wanted to share these two because um, I think they do an exceptional job with, with digital retailing and omni-channel commerce. And you know, we're also uh, going to provide in PDF format a few resources here. You know, I mentioned the Bain and Company brief. That's probably the best uh, white paper that I've seen in the industry in a long time. Um, it was just released a few weeks ago. I highly encourage everyone to read the future of car sales as omni-channel. Um, it's, it's spot on. And then um, there's an Ernst & Young white paper, The Future of Automotive Retail. That's another great one where it really you know, focuses on that customer-centric uh, approach, the Steve Jobs thing I was talking about. Uh, they do a great job on that. And then there's a, a J.D. Power white paper on the top trends to improve your retail experience in 2017. These are all really good, um, really good pieces you should read. Yes, and they're all actually uh, available for all of you to download immediately. They're in the handouts section of the GoToWebinar interface. So if you've ever been on the show before, check out the handouts section. You'll find all three of these white papers in there as well as today's slide deck available to you for immediate download right now until the end of this broadcast. Cool. All right. <laughs> so I've got just a, a really – this is to recap things, some action items um, that I encourage. You know, start developing your plan now. D don't waste time because I can tell you your competition is already developing their plan. They're starting to learn already. And the other thing is just there invariably is a, a fair amount of inertia to overcome within your, your dealership. You know, you've been doing certain processes for 5, 10, 20, 80 years inside the dealership. Um, it takes time. And then the second thing is, you know, really think holistically about the customer journey. It's, it's very easy to get caught up in the different departments of your dealership and trying to optimize each one of those without looking across the entire customer journey and you're seeing what the customer has to deal with on a Saturday when they're at the store for five to seven hours. Um, so make sure your processes and, and tools are designed for a true omni-channel way um, that the customers are 
fine. I mean, they're doing it, so your process should really match what they want to do. Be respectful of their time. And then third, you know, leverage and include your people every step of the way in order to develop buy-in and, and let them drive the change alongside with you versus being a resistance against you. If, if you if you get them, and I, I see this all the time in the implementations we do, when it's a very inclusive operation, it works really well. When there is a dealer principal or a GM who's a little bit more authoritarian about this, yeah, it can work that way too, but your likelihood of success is going to be much lower. So I highly encourage that collaborative approach every step of the way. And then the fourth thing is, you know, take action and start learning now. It's very easy to procrastinate this, especially with, you know, with today. Today's the uh, 17th, I think. You know, <laughs> you've got to get your numbers. You, you're, you're already starting to stress out about getting your numbers for May. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's easy to punt this to, to June and then July and then August and then all of a sudden it's 2019. You know, you just you got to start taking action. Establish your first beachhead. Get ahead of the game and then ultimately roll this out for a true omni-channel solution. But, but don't be overwhelmed by, by the long-term things you have to do. Get that beachhead and start learning fast. Um, that's, that's the best way to do it, then start iterating. I mean, there's no wrong time to start rolling it out, is there? I mean, is there a better time of the year to do it and not do it? Well, I think it's I, – I wouldn't say so much it's the time of year. I think it's a little bit more around – what big projects are in the, on the, in the pipeline for the group, the dealership, the group, who, whomever's making the decisions, mm -hmm. right? Make sure you can focus enough energy to plan and do it right. So, you know, if you're changing your DMS, that might not be the best time to do it. Um, Fair enough. You know, if you're changing CRM tools, make sure you get clean on that and then, you know, crank on this. Um, so just make sure you can focus enough energy to make sure it's successful. All right, very good. All right, audience, have you gotten in your question yet for today's expert, Rudy Toon? If you haven't, I don't know what you're waiting for. Now is the time. Get those questions, and we're going to get to your Q&A session in just a little bit. Before we do that, as I said just a moment ago, thank you for joining me, Rudy, on the webcam. As I said mm -hmm. a moment ago, um, we have that great handouts section of the GoToWebinar interface. So if you would like today's slide deck, and or any of the amazing white papers that Rudy has provided to us, yes, go on to your GoToWebinar interface. Look kind of low on the interface. You're looking for the word that says handouts. There's a little triangle next to it. Click on that. It'll open up. And in there, you'll find four wonderful handouts for you. Like I said before, we have Rudy Toon's slide deck. We have that Bain brief on the future of car sales is omnichannel. We have uh, the white paper from J.D. Power, Top Trends to Improve Your Retail Experience, and that EY uh, uh, handout as well, The Future of Automotive Retail, all amazing reads, and you should have them. So you have until the end of this broadcast to get those for yourself. Okay. Oh, 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 very excited. Mm -hmm. I wish I had some game show music. That's right. Six years of me giving away prizes. Still haven't gotten any game show music for myself. But guess what? It's that mm -hmm. time. If you missed it at the beginning of the webinar, well, I announced that our good friends over at Roadster, they're handing out a great prize today on the webinar. All you have to do is get up there and be the first person to answer our giveaway question correctly. And you could score yourself a $100 Amazon gift card. Let's go to that next slide, Rudy. All right. Yep. I'm We're trying. Ask... Oh, there it goes. There Sorry. you go. <laughs> We're going to yeah. ask that if you are a vendor, that you kindly sit this out. This prize is intended mm -hmm. for dealership personnel only. We do love having you on the show, though. So please, always, you're always welcome here on the Dealer On webinar. Okay. But for right now, all you dealership people, get to your keyboards, get those fingers nice and nimble. First person to write in the correct response is going to win a $100 Amazon gift card. That is not the correct answer. I love when people try and guess the question. Okay, here we go. Good luck, everyone. <laughs> According to the 2015 Cox Automotive study, out of 4,002 respondents, how many were satisfied with their recent car buying experience? And yeah, it was like a punch in the gut when I heard this answer. Okay, let's see. 
Daniel Green, correct. 17, not percent, 17 <laughs> people out of 4,002 people. Oh my goodness, that makes me, makes me sweat. That's yeah. such a terrible number. All right, Daniel Green. Oh, it's official. I wrote your name down, Daniel Green. Congratulations. Daniel Green is with the Robert Green Auto Group, established in 1968. Congratulations, Daniel Green. You're going to have to send me a mailing address just in case so I can get it to our good friends over at Roadster, and they can get that prize out to you as quickly as possible. Now, audience, I know. Your name's not Daniel Green. Mine isn't either. We didn't win this prize. It's awful. But you know what? We well. have cool prizes every week here on the Dealer on Webinar. So come on back for another Dealer on Webinar. That could be your lucky day. You win a cool prize. But for right now, big props over to Daniel Green over at the Robert Green Auto Group. I have no idea what part of the country they're in, but hopefully he'll tell me soon. Congratulations, Daniel. Enjoy it. Spend it on something really delicious. And... Of course, we got to thank our good friends over at Roadster, Roadster for their incredible generosity. So thank you for that, Rudy. All right. Oh, they're mm -hmm. in New York. Good to know. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next slide because now we're going to get into some questions. Rudy, are you ready? We have a handful of great questions for you. Not too tough. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Cameron wrote in nice and early, and you kind of covered it, but let's just mm -hmm. say Cameron has a boss who doesn't know what digital retailing is. Can you give Cameron a quick and dirty definition, elevator definition, let's call it, of what digital retailing is and why a dealership could do it real fast, like give me the mm, just Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the way I usually describe digital retailing is it's the the digitization of each piece of the transaction. And so it's it's you know, putting it into a digital format so that customers can then transact whenever, wherever they are. And that's really powerful, and you can actually do that in most other categories, pretty much every other category at this point. Um, but what it does is it, it gives them what they want, and then from a dealership perspective, it provides tremendous efficiencies as well. So, you know, um, if a customer wants to buy that car at midnight on Thursday, uh, they can go ahead and do that, and, and it's like a deal that falls into your lap. Doesn't happen that often, but it will happen. Um, hap it does happen all the time across our dealerships. Um, so that I think when you're trying to convince um, management about you know why this is important, um, it really is about making the customer happy and then reducing the sales costs at the dealership. I've I know I'm, I'm answering this kind of long, but no, you do fine. <laughs> I see numbers. I, I've seen numbers that that range for for sales costs. In, in our industry between $1,200 and $2,000 per transaction. So that's not marketing, that's sales costs. There's typically seven to eight people involved in, a, in the sales transaction itself at the dealership. And those people are all paid in one way or another. And if you amortize it across the transactions, it ends up being somewhere between $1,200 and $2,000 per car, and you add the $650 for marketing, you're already at what twenty five hundred dollars potentially of, of just you know, margin compression right there. So that's that's why. Let's 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 automate things. Let's let the customer do the work because they want to, and by digitizing the transaction, you know, we we all win. So, digital retailing, when done correctly, will not only lower your cost, your investment to sell the car, but you will sell more cars. You, you should. You, I mean, if if you, if you can differentiate your experience and make it a better shopping experience than your competitors, you should sell more cars. Let's just say you, you even didn't sell more cars. That that doesn't need to be the driver for the decision, right? In, in this, you know, the, the SAR today, right? Where we did maybe 17.6 million in sales last mm -hmm. uh, last year. I think it was you know record kind of numbers probably going to start going down, right? It's probably going to be hitting 15 in the next couple of years. We'll see. Um, no one really knows, but there's a lot of pressure. So in that shrinking SAR world um, and shrinking margins, like you really got to figure out a way to reduce costs in, at the dealership um, and, uh, and differentiate your experience, and, and this is the best way to do it. 
Okay, thank you so much. So, um, Cameron, great question. We're going to hear from Cameron again in a little bit. Um, I have a question for you because I know earlier in the presentation you talked about, you know, gearing your um, uh, employees up for this. Mm -hmm. Who in your dealership, if you owned a dealership, who in your dealership would you put in charge? Who's going to lead the charge? I know you said you had to pick the right person. What are you mm -hmm. looking for in that person? Is it is it the role that they have right now, or is there certain uh, <laughs> qualities yeah, that I, I, I think for? yeah, I think I can answer that a couple different ways. And every dealership, I mean, one thing I've learned over the last fifteen years is that every dealership is somewhat unique in the way that they're run. There's no you know <laughs> a blueprint for this. Um, it, it comes down to somebody who obviously is respected at, at the dealership. They have mm -hmm. the political capital. Um, and get can get people to follow them. Um, they need to be curious. Like they, they need to be interested in change. If they're too vested in the old model, whether it's a comp plan um, that they've been on for the last 15 years or something like that, if they're too vested in the old model and you, you're, you know that they're resistant to change, probably not a good person to, to be picking. So it's that intellectual curiosity, the desire to really want to, to not have that number be 17 out of 4,002. Like it has to be a, a genuine desire to improve the, the shopping experience and, and, and lead the, the team to, to transition. So, um, and that could be a different person at the store. I mean, in some cases, it's an internet director who um, has a lot of respect at the store. It might be the GM, it could be the GSM. In some cases, it's even the finance director who has a vision for, for where this is going and, and they know that there's a smarter way to do it. I've seen it all. Um, you know, what, what doesn't work is, you know, a dealer principal who's who's not involved in the day to day, um, just making a decision and then just pawning it off without. without okay, all right. Well, I mean, I, it seems like it's a full time job for one person. Is it not? It's it, something it, that if it, you are it, no, it doesn't have to be a full time job. And in fact, I would say it's not. I mean, it's okay. It's it, it, you know, because it's not one person's job. It's one person to maybe lead. But if you do this the right way and involve the rest of the, the crew and in, in figuring this stuff out and optimizing for, for your dealership, everyone else will do the work too. It's when you don't involve them, then you're doing all the work yourself and you're, you're pushing a rope. And, uh, so uh, it's not a full-time job. All right. All right. Good to know. All right. It, it probably shouldn't be. It probably shouldn't be. It's got to be somebody who really understands. Like, it's somebody who understands how the dealership works, uh, the inner workings. Um, very well, and that typically isn't somebody that you know um, is, has nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, here we go. Next, by the way, thank you for answering my question. Um, next question comes in from Chuck. Chuck says, "Do you recommend getting rid of click for e price on websites?" I'm seeing a lot of dealerships do that. How how would it work if uh, if you were in charge? I mean, do you do you have Sure. Research well, showing uh, that click for e price yeah. is actually a good thing on your website. Well, so uh, I don't like click for e price, and, and I know that many, many. Well, so you know, there's, there's a couple different reasons that's done, right? But the, one of them is because the dealership it doesn't want to show the price uh, up front. <laughs> okay. But but just as but just as much, there are advertising covenants from a lot of the OEMs that don't allow you to show a price either a you know for, for the luxury brands below MSRP uh, for the mainstream brands they might not be able to show a price below invoice and so that's just a mechanism for creating a one-to-one -one connection that then allows you to um, bypass that ad covenant and actually provide a market price to that customer so there's different scenarios what I I don't like the idea that I have to, you know, provide my contact information and wait for an email um, that's going to come in um, and then potentially get, you know, spammed um, after that. I mean, what we like, what we would prefer is, hey, if, if you have to satisfy the ad covenant with an unlock mechanism or something like that, provide the price right there on the screen. Like, let's let's get the transaction going. And and I don't, it shouldn't be like a dead end. I get the price and now I'm off, I'm into the offline world. Give me the price, and then let me go deeper and deeper and deeper in selecting every element of the transaction, the service and protection plan. Let me look at six different lease options. Let me look at the different finance options. I should be able to do all those things. And the, the get-me-price 
it's flat. There's no depth to that to that experience. And Chuck wrote back and he says, ding, 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 ding. By the way, for the record, I hate the click for e price on my <laughs> right. website. Yeah, so that's the, two of, that's the two of us. All right, but I, you know, I understand. What, what brand is, uh, is he selling? Chuck, what brand are you selling? Subaru. Mm. Okay. And I would have to say, um, I'm pretty sure Subaru um, clients are pretty savvy on the web. So. Yes. Very much so, yeah. Yes, so he agrees. Okay, so Chuck, thank you so much yeah. for bringing that up. We have another price question for you, Rudy. This one comes in from Cameron. Okay. I told you we hear from Cameron again. Cameron says, yeah. in regards to price, we put pricing on the vehicles that post to various sites like Car Gurus, Cars.com, etc. But on our own website, we keep the prices off. Is that a huge negative? Well, I guess. It depends on why they're doing that. Um, generally speaking, I would I would be against that. I mean, if you're putting your price out to those other areas, um, why should they be encouraged to go to a third-party site to get your price versus coming to your own site? You, you, know, you don't want to be paying car gurus and everyone else for all your business. Like, let's have the customer come to your website and get what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that's how I would answer that. Um, but maybe there's a reason that I, I don't understand. But, but I, I would highly encourage the, the transparency on your own website. Well, um, and Cameron, I've picked up a couple of things in my years of doing webinars. I can tell you that a lead that comes from your own website is going to have, uh, I believe, six times more effectiveness than a lead that comes from a third-party website for the same exact yeah. car. So you want to get them right. on your website. And why would they right. be on your website if you're not giving them all the information that they can find on right. the third-party website? That's right. So that's just another reason, along with the, all the ones that Rudy said with transparency mm. and a great customer experience and so on, to make sure that you give them everything that they're looking for right on your website right. but that's just our opinion right. we don't know anything all right here we go yeah. uh cameron <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah. all right last question unless another one sneaks in is from today's winner daniel all right daniel what do you got all right daniel says are today's roadsters dealers mostly institutional dealer groups or are you also having success with family-owned and smaller groups, with multi-generational groups? How do you overcome baby boomer DPs or key decision makers who don't quite get the technology or why it matters when the Gen Y family members or management don't have enough juice to make that level of a strategy shift? Okay, so oh, Daniel, yeah. basically what you're asking is how do we get the old timers who own dealerships <laughs> to come yeah. around to this new way of selling cars? Is that right? All right, Ruby, yeah. what do you got? Oh yeah, I, li I live this issue, you know, on a daily basis. But we've we certainly work with larger, you know, public dealer groups, and then very small ma pa, you know, father son father daughter uh, dealerships, uh, mother son mother daughter. I should include them all. Um, <laughs> Thank so, you. Your feminism uh, is showing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I've seen it all. I really have. Uh, one of our New Jersey dealerships is exactly that situation. So, um, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's definitely a challenging problem. We've, I, I've probably, I'm working with probably 30 dealerships in that exact scenario. And one of the things I, I like to show is just the, the feedback in those net promoter score surveys that we send out mm -hmm. uh, on behalf of the dealership. So it's, you know, white labeled, the dealership sends out a net promoter score survey and then uh, we get the results, and oftentimes the people will write in how wonderful that sales experience was. It's very tangible to see that and read it and just you know absorb it. And um, I think the bar, unfortunately, is relatively low for for what the expectation is. And when you can go that much higher, um, customers will just love you for it. So I like to show that to the uh, you know the matriarch or patriarch who's kind of still running things. And um, it really resonates. Um, and I also think, you know, doing a, a thorough demo and just showing how easy it actually is is really important because, you know, fear of the unknown is usually what's driving that. You know, as, as people get a little older, mm -hmm. um, they just don't want to try new things. So you really just got to keep 
putting it in front of them and letting them play with it, and um, they'll they usually come around. Um, it hasn't actually been that big of a problem um, to, to date. We, we can usually get there. All right. And with that, Rudy Tune, excellent, excellent first job yeah. on a dealer on webinar. I loved it. If you have another yeah. topic, I'd love to see you come back. <laughs> And uh, oh, what, is well, it too early for me to already tell you to come back? <laughs> no, 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 no. I was going to say thank you very much. I think you, you, know, you do a great job putting these together. Thank uh, you. I and, appreciate and congrats that. Congrats again on, on six years, six years of weekly webinars. A dealer on webinar. How many, does that mean you've done, you've done, what, 300 probably by now? I am. I'm like coming that? up on my 300th show very, very shortly. You, you mark them? Number like this is number two ninety seven. I don't. But I'm gonna have to go back and just count them because you know at the end of the year we don't do one near Christmas. We don't do one on Thanksgiving, obviously. So, but it's a, yeah. it's a good fifty or so a year. But by the way, Daniel wrote back in. Um, he says when it comes to high level strategy, are large dealer groups that much more sophisticated? Someone explained it to me once as imagine Olive Garden and your local Italian restaurant sold exactly the same food. Who would win? <laughs> mm. You know, it's funny. I, I, they might be more sophisticated in some ways, and in other ways, they've got all the same problems. Um, uh, it, it, you're solving the same challenges. The big dealer groups still have individual stores that have all the same dynamics, um, and maybe they go a little more heavy-handed on certain things and, and push things through. But the the it, it's all the same problems, it, and they're all solvable with you know addressing the, those five big issues that I talked about. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's not that different. Well, I can tell you from, and, and Rudy, I don't know if you know this about me, but uh, my regular audience does. I've never worked at a dealership, never have claimed to work mm -hmm. at a dealership, never done it. But I have bought a lot of cars at dealerships, and I am the ultimate consumer. I am hooked on Amazon, hooked on eBay, you name it. I always buy stuff online. That being said, I can tell you, if you concentrate on the customer experience and making it frictionless, and it it almost doesn't matter if you are more money because if they can get mm -hmm. it quicker, yeah. frictionless, have great customer experience, great customer service, you will win that customer every time, yeah. every time, yeah. even if you are a few bucks more than the guy down the street. Yeah, not always about right. price. Change, change the conversation. Change it to convenience versus price, and you yes. got to figure out how to pivot that pivot that conversation. And um, you know, digital retailing really helps you do that. It's something else to talk about. Yes. Remember, I mean, that awful study that you referenced, out of four yeah. th over 4,000 people, only 17 uh, out of 4,000 right. people loved their, right. their car buying experience. That's awful. Right. We have to do better right. as an industry. We have yeah. got to get that number up, and we have got to make customers love the car buying experience, not just the end result of actually getting the car, yeah. but the car right, buying right. Exactly. So, Rudy, with that, sir, it was a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. I hope this isn't the last time I get you on the show. Thank I know you. I had to do some arm Me twisting too. to make Me it too. happen. <laughs> but not at all. Not so at all. Much. Let's do it. It was great. I want to well, remind the audience a link to download a copy of this webinar recording is going to be emailed to you later today. Please don't be shy. Share it. Use it as a, a point of reference and feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. Today's webinar is also going to be posted online. All you have to do is go to dealeron.com slash webinar. And from there, you can view our upcoming webinar schedule or access any of our past webinars too. And hey, in just a few minutes, actually less than a minute probably, you're going to get a short survey. So please fill it out. We're always looking for quality feedback from our audience. We want to know what you thought of today's presentation. So let us know. Let your opinion be heard. It's three short questions. And if you're a Honda, Chevy, or a Toyota dealer, you can save almost $5,000 a year on the industry's best SEO. That's right. Right over here at Dealer on. We actually won awards for it. So sounds great, right? Just click yes at the end of the webinar in the survey. We're going to make some SEO magic happen for you. Remember, it's a webinar only exclusive deal just for you. And invitations will be going out tomorrow for our next Dealer On webinar. Online merchandising strategies that lead to profits and growth. 
So, speed to market and effective online merchandising are essential keys to the profitable growth of any dealership. However, the majority of dealerships need improvements in one or both of those things. So, in this exciting one-hour webinar, Russ Daniels from HomeNet will share cutting-edge techniques about online merchandising that lead to a bigger bottom line. Attendees of this incredible, insightful webinar will hear about industry insights and best practices in today's marketplace, ways to differentiate yourself with online merchandising in the future, what's working today with online merchandising and where online merchandising is going in the future, the next trends coming in social media, personalization, and interactive content, technology and car shopper behavior that will play a role in online merchandising for years to come, and trends that dealers and vendors need to start adopting to ensure long-term success. Cut down your online time to market and increase your profits. If you want to learn the online merchandising strategies that lead to profits and growth, well, you can't afford to miss this presentation, so register now. Don't forget, Dealer On's weekly webinars are held Thursdays, 12 noon Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, and 9 a.m. Pacific. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions regarding our webinars and our topics, hey, get in touch with me. I'd love to hear from you. I'm everywhere online. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Google+. I'm on all the automotive social networks. Or you know what? You can just email me directly at eliana at dealeron.com. I would love to hear from you. Now, before I let you go, I want to thank you all for spending this time with us today, and I hope to see you all on another webinar in our continuing education series. Take care, everyone. <laughs> see ya.